Hello, hello, welcome. What a glorious day, another one. Wow, are we lucky. So I want to tell you a little about Joan. Joan Goldstein was initially appointed commissioner of the Department of Economic Development in April 2015 by Governor Peter Shumlin and then reappointed the position by Governor Phil Scott. Big deal, by the way. <laughs> During her tenure, Commissioner Goldstein has built a multi-talented team of professionals with varied expertise across sectors including finance, technology, small business, and government. She has a particular interest in advancing the state's entrepreneurial activities. Prior to serving as commissioner, Goldstein was executive director of the Green Mountain Economic Development Corporation, serving northern Windsor and Orange Counties. She was also an advisor at the Vermont Small Business Development Center. Please give a warm welcome to Joan Goldstein. <laughs> well, thank you very much for inviting me here today and um, with quite an introduction and also I'm realizing the title is quite a lot to live up to, that economic development is going to solve all of our ills and I just, uh, I'm, I'm a little nervous about that, but uh, having said that, I'm excited to talk to you about the topic. Um, full confession, I'm, I've only, I'm a newcomer to Vermont, I've only lived 19 years, <laughs> and, um, and, and before moving to Vermont, most of my experience was in finance, in large global financial institutions. So moving to Vermont was an adjustment of many, many levels. I, I decided to move farm town, in, and my background was like large-scale project management, national sales and marketing, and it was like, okay. <laughs> so. That began my career in more sort of nonprofit and governmental type operations. Also, you know, with a nod towards small business. Vermont is made up of tremendous amount of small business. A blessing and in some ways a curse. So I'll get a little bit more into that as we go through it. Um, first, I wanted to ask people, when you hear economic development, what do you think? Any volunteer? <laughs> yep. Think of people getting jobs. That's great. Anything else? Any other? Yep. Our tax money at work. Correct. Work? Yep. Yes. New businesses in. Did I hide your hand? I just said. Commitment to growth. And uh, right here. Excellent. Very, not everyone heard that. It's protecting business manufacturing that's already located here. So, tension. Of Other hand. Opportunity. That is such a key word that I'm going to, going to stick on that. Everything that everyone said is true. It's such an all encompassing field which is why the government gets involved. You might wonder, why is the government involved in economic development? Well, twofold. One is there's a human uh, interaction, right, about human capital development. But there's also a very strong fiscal reason why governments are involved in economic development. Um, and we'll also get into that. So turn the page. I'm probably going off script, right, Chris? <laughs> Guilty as charged. Um, so, Okay, let's talk about affordability. We hear it an awful lot. It's on the governor's agenda. We want to make Vermont more affordable. What does that mean? Price increase? What does affordability mean? Anybody have a, yep. Sorry? Income of the population keeping up with the cost of goods and services. Excellent. Somebody in the back had their hand? Yep, in the blue. So not just keeping up, but, but 
an ability to meet their basic needs and then some, right? attracting new people to the state and providing housing that they could afford. These are all the key, you've all touched on the key affordability issues. So I look at it very much the way you look at when you, when you are managing your household budget, right, and you say, I can't afford this or I can't afford that. What do you take into consideration? You take into consideration what's incoming and what's outgoing. Very basic, very fundamental budgeting. And so on a state scale, it's sort of like, okay, we have a certain cost of what it costs to provide services. And that cost typically doesn't go down. But we share that burden with X amount of people. And if there aren't enough taxpayers to share the burden, the expense for each individual goes up. And so the idea here is just we need to add to the tax base, bringing in more people, more working people, um, working age people so that we have a workforce so that businesses can grow. Um, increase wages doesn't mean necessarily artificially saying, okay, everyone's going to get a raise. It's more about high paying jobs are usually the result of high, higher skill sets. So it's, it's making sure there's opportunity for those businesses to grow and there's opportunity for every individual to get the ability to train or get the education necessary to get into those higher paid. Again, trying to increase the incoming. And, and then it's a supply demand dynamic, right? The housing stock here is probably one of the oldest housing stock in the nation. And we're not doing an awful lot of building. I mean, you may see building around here in Chittenden County, but around the state, it's very scant. So we're not keeping up with the demand for it. So to me, affordability is let's get back to basics. We're not making enough money. You either reduce your expenses or you're increasing your earnings. And so on a state scale, that's very much uh, true. But we need to add more activity, um, bring in more people, uh, make sure they're working, make sure the labor participation rate is increasing. There are opportunities uh, in the state, and I'll show you a little bit more about details about what people are earning, and then you'll get to see the picture of why it's so dire. So on a state scale, I just thought this would be interesting to see where does the state uh, earn their revenue. And the largest single um, uh, component is personal income tax. And so, um, yeah, on a human scale, you want to make sure people are employed gainfully. But on a fiscal, it's really the single most important contributor. You also have the statewide property tax. And then these are all other sources. The $2.89 billion is like everything sales meals and rooms, um, use tax, other excise fees, and fees, I, I would say, uh, if we could. And then to see where most of the money goes, right? And we think about this as a budget. And every year we go into a budgeting exercise. We're in that cycle right now where we um, go in and try to ask for different things. And, and, um, yeah, and that's the whole governmental legislative process. But, so the revenues are about, this was uh, fiscal year 23, 5.3 billion. Um, and the, by far the largest, um, sorry, that was the revenues. The spending was education was the, the largest expenditure, 2.3 billion. Transportation, 724. Human services, 670 million. Now, to give you an idea, economic development, we're like probably one of the smallest departments in state government. And, our budget is about $8 million, $5 million of which comes from general funds. So just to give you the idea of the scale, these are enormous agencies. As we know, education fund, education, uh, they're getting revenues from ev just about everywhere, not just the property tax, but also meals, um, alcohol tax, rooms, rooms and meals tax, sales revenue. That, so it's just really this large expenditure. I'm going to go to the next. Um, I thought I'd also talk about demographics because that's kind of what we're up against here. The only uh, cohort of population that grew is the population 65 and over. And the working age population from 25 to 64 is on the decline um, and, and not, looking, not looking too positive. Um, when I say that the blessing and the curse of small business, small business is great. It's really the backbone. I think it's something like 
of the businesses here are like fewer than five, something like that. I think I have another stat here. But you'll see fewer than 20, I'm trying to see what the axis is, about 50,000 it looks like, and then 100, 000, another 50,000, 20 to 99. And there's another 50 or so that are, well, a little bit more than 50 that are 500 employees or more. And um, yeah, small businesses in total accounted for 60% of employment in 2020, which exceeded the national small business scale. Now the beauty of that is that people, we need entrepreneurs to start businesses and grow their business. Um, for young people, if they're working in a small business, let's say less than five, very limited room for them to grow. And so we want to hang on to youth or younger employment. Sometimes the best place to get your start is in a larger business because there are more there are more, um, there's like a career ladder opportunity. Again, getting back to opportunity. How do we create the experience human capital? It's by being in an organization where there's opportunity for promotion. There's opportunity for a new skill set. Uh, it's very, very difficult in a small, small business. Um, and then we looked at earnings as well, because when we, we did some uh, data collection from the Department of Tax to just look at what are Vermonters earning. This is just W-2 data from 2023. And the big green section, 66% are making less than $50,000 a year. 26% between 50 and 100, and 8% over, are making over 100,000. That is a very, I always thought this was a stunning pie chart because at $50,000 a year, it's difficult to support yourself. Forget about buying a house, and forget about buying a house you know, in a high income area, like say Chittenden County. So, and in most cases, the people making that lesser money are on some sort of federal you know, or state program. So this is tough. This is tough to support. What, ideally, what you want to do is increase those ranges at 26%. You want the people in the lower range earning more. You know? And so some of that has to do with training. And, the jobs that people are in. So um, we did a study with, with some consultants just to find out why that, why that stunning picture was. And in, we looked at the Vermont resident workforce of 328,642. And about two thirds are working in occupations that don't require any post-secondary training of any sort. Um, and and so the lower the skill, the lower the pay, generally speaking. Um, and the ones that require post-secondary, some sort of education or training uh, are the higher paid opportunities. So it starts to make a little bit of sense about why two-thirds are, you know, two-thirds are making less than 50 and two-thirds also are in jobs that don't require a significant amount of training or expertise. Now, when you take that, those stats and then you look at the price of housing and you see the mismatch really clearly because in Chittenden County, and this was as of 23, Chittenden County, the median cost was uh, 590000 the median listing price, to be specific. And in Essex County, it was 320000 The only uh, county where a family earning the median family income can afford a median-priced home is Essex County. So it's no wonder that there is this high demand curve for housing, and I think I have some more stats on that after. So there was a study done, I believe it was a combination of Vermont Housing Finance Agency to look at the need for housing. Statewide, we need 24 to 36,000 units by 2029, a huge number, and that's five years away, right? Um, Chittenden County, 8,000 to 11,000. And right now, we issue about 2,300 permits annually. So we're really way below what is necessary. And if there is that scarcity, then you're generally going to continue to have this really, really sharp house price issue for new entrants or people who want to size down. If you want to get a smaller house, where are you moving to if you don't have the opportunity to move? Um, the state, uh, over the last four years, has uh, invested $400 million in housing. Now, we'll start to see the outcomes. We are starting to see the outcomes of that. There have been a fair amount of ribbon cuttings and 
whatnot on affordable housing. It was to support new housing units, also to fix up vacant units, and to just expand the shelter capacity. There is um, a new Act 250 and a map going into place as a result of last uh, legislative session. The intent was to make it easier to build. Um, there have been a couple of different things thrown in. It isn't necessarily going to be easy to build, especially in the rural areas. But um, we are uh, we're right in the midst of having to, I think there's a, that link takes us to the interim exemption map. And basically any town that's got water and sewer capacity already and zoning and planning in place um, has some um, exemptions. Uh, well, that was just a picture of the map, right? That isn't the map. It covers the exemptions um, that will exist now, the interim between right now, 2024, and 2027, when these new tiered maps will go into place. There are going to be a few different tiers where there won't be any Act 250 required. And it's generally in towns that are already have built up uh, capacity at their town level. They have uh, water and wastewater infrastructure. Um, so it's just a way to see where, you know, if you want to build, take a look at the interim um, map and see if you're in an area or if you want to build in an area where you can get that exemption. There was also some rental revitalization. We called it the Vermont Housing Improvement Program. And um, for a very small amount of money for each applicant, if you're a landlord and, you know, a particular uh, unit went offline just because it fell into disrepair. You just needed help getting that up to speed. You could get a grant from that program. Uh, so it's a lot less expensive to bring a unit back online that's already built rather than building a new unit. And that's being helped by our sister department called Vermont Housing and Community Development. So um, I should say, I didn't say at the beginning, I was supposed to say that the Agency of Commerce has three departments, Department of Economic Development, Department of Housing and Community Development, and, Depar and Department of Tourism and Marketing. And generally, like housing and community development, they're working on housing policy. Um, tourism and marketing is all about promotional activity, about the recreational assets of the state. In Department of Economic Development, predominantly we're working on business retention, expansion, recruitment, um, we work on infrastructure, um, incremental financing districts for municipalities so that there's infrastructure there so we could build out housing and also uh, economic development incentives. But we also have a variety of other programs that are generally meant to help businesses grow. It's also meant to um, foster entrepreneurship. And we had a few programs on here that were as a result of the ARPA money, which is the American Rescue Plan Act funding. Put our hand. So, no, so I think um, the comparison there was just to show, on average, a, a small grant to rehab a unit is about $40,000, whereas if you had to build a new house, the average cost of that is $500,000. So even all the tax credit financing that happens in the state, both through federal and state programs, it's very expensive to build housing units. So I just, that was by way of comparison. So V helped 41 Chittenden County units get back online, and 24 more are in the pipeline. It, it got funded, I think, two years ago and then last year, and so that program is continuing to, I think it still has money. So I could go through these um, just to give you an idea. Um, the one incentive we have for business growth or recruitment is what we call the Vermont Employment Growth Incentive. So if a business wants to grow, let's say um, in Chittenden County, a good example is OnLogic, um, they would apply to this incentive program and they would do a projection of how many jobs are they creating over the next five years and how much capital investment are they making. 
and it gets put through an econometric model to understand what type of revenue does that bring to the state. And there's assumptions built into that, like it, you know, how much sales revenue will be generated, how much income tax, how much, all dependent upon kind of the wage rate. And the employer has to meet um, wage levels that are at least 160% of the minimum wage. And um, they, the way it works is they get approved for this incentive, but they don't get the money up front. What they have to do is the following year when they file for taxes, they, they show the tax department, and the tax department is able to verify this through payroll tax and whatnot, how many jobs did they create, how much payroll did increase, and how much capital investment was made. And if they hit all the targets, they get the incentive. If they didn't hit the targets, they don't get it. And they have a little bit of grace. They have like two years to make it up because things happen like recessions or whatnot. Um, but when they do meet the target, they get the money, but they only get a fifth of the incentive that they've earned. The incentive program is an ironclad way of ensuring that we're not giving money to somebody who met the target one year and the next year left town and got all the state uh, taxpayer money. So it's a very, very, um, I guess, prudent when you think about it in terms of taxpayer um, accountability, uh, some employers just, you know, people balk at it because it is hard to get, um, but it's for very good reason. This is all very legislatively directed. This is not something that we just came up with. It's all driven by statute and regulated by statute. Um, the other, I don't see it here, but I'll, I'll talk about it, um, is the Tax Incremental Financing District. The reason why I'm going to put those together is that they're both overseen by a separate body called the Vermont Economic Progress Council. And that is a council of uh, appointed folks, appointed by the governor, that we have some representation from the legislature for balance. Um, and they hear these employers pitch, you know, about why they need this incentive. They have to prove, you know, but for the incentive, they wouldn't do the expansion. And an equivalent um, idea is a municipality could get what they call um, a design of a tax incremental financing district. And that is where a town like delineates where do they want development. And they might have a private developer lined up, but they need infrastructure built out. And so once the town presents to VEPSI, we call VEPSI, that's the council, that but for this incremental financing district, that development's not going to come to town or without that infrastructure. So then the town goes into debt, issues the debt to build the infrastructure, and from the incremental revenue generated from that additional development, they're able to pay back that bond. So it helps towns so they don't have to take it all on themselves, and it helps development happen because then the developer sees, okay, the town is going to help get this infrastructure in place. I mean, the, one of the building blocks, or one of the real blocks and obstacles to development is that there is not sufficient infrastructure capacity around the state. You know, you'll see towns in Chittenden County are improving it or extending it. That's great. Other places in the state, not so lucky. So it's really hard to build housing without infrastructure. It's really hard to build out an industrial park if you don't have water, wastewater. So the, these are, those two are the, uh, the major um, um, incentives. The, um, the other thing I should bring up is the brownfields revitalization. Um, brownfields are basically contaminated sites and they're all over the state and it's based on our industrial past and there had been you know maybe substances that weren't necessarily deemed harmful. Well guess what they are and so the Agency of Natural Resources has a tremendous database of these contaminated properties and when you think about it, it's all underutilized land. You know, our prosperity is dependent upon how well we utilize land, labor, and capital. And so if you have all this idle land that's contaminated, we need to do something about it and you know, act as a catalyst to help those developers do something with the land. And there are examples all over the state. Um, on our site, accd.vermont.gov, you could see some examples where uh, they've applied to the state for what we call remediation. What happens is all the scientists come in, they characterize what's in the ground or what's in the air, and they develop a corrective action plan to eliminate or mitigate the risk to human health. And once the corrective action plan is done, 
then we could apply the money to it. And there have been millions of dollars. We got, over the last several years, we got like $17 million in this program to help development happen. And there are a number of housing developments all over the state um, to, do, to get this done. And so we're excited about this. This seems to be a non-controversial uh, ask. Every time at the legislature, it's the one thing that both parties like and the administration likes and both chambers like. So I thought I would talk about that. And there's still so many more to do. Uh, there's a very big project on 453 Pine Street in Burlington that was going to go forward and it has stopped and it's unfortunate because there is significant um, brownfields there. Am I going over? No. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I don't want to be imbalanced in this. Like, it's not all. But we've been prioritizing housing, just because of housing being such a need, that we prioritize the projects that bring about housing or economic development. And outdoor recreation is, a, is economic development. Um, the other uh, program I want to bring attention is something we're calling the Rural Industrial Development Program. And a lot of these programs, um, like the Brownfields, Rural Industrial, State Small Business, Capital Improvement, Community Recovery, all done with federal ARPA dollars. If it wasn't done directly with the Federal American Rescue Plan dollars, it was done with general fund dollars. The state had been flush with cash over the last couple of years because of the influx of federal largesse, right? So we've had some excess revenue years, and we actually got a memo saying, what are the programs and what are the projects that you would do, but you've never had the funding to do? And I was like, OK. <laughs> I got I've got a lot to say here. So we developed uh, quite a few, and uh, Brownfields is one. The Rural Industrial Development Program is where you know, we may have a business that's growing, but cannot find suitable space in which to expand. So there aren't a lot of empty industrial sites or commercial sites. And what will happen is if that business could find an available site, let's say in New Hampshire or in Massachusetts, it makes it that much easier for them to actually locate their expansion there. So that's a vulnerability that we have, and we thought let's get funding so that we could get the funding out to the regional development corporations. Those are the regional economic developers who know their regions backwards and forwards. They know who the property owners are. They know what's happening in the business community. So we get the money to them to help them either buy land, build a building, renovate a building so that a business could expand or locate in the state. Because we want to eliminate or at least alleviate some of those obstacles to growth. So that was, I, I just spoke to a business yesterday on the phone who said they need to move. Their current space just doesn't have the footprint for an expansion, you know, can't, can't expand any longer. What are they going to do? And so immediately you get on guard because like, you realize there aren't that many. There isn't a large inventory of empty space. Um, you know, and I'm not talking about office space. It's really about either warehouse, distribution, assembly, that type of work, or manufacturing. Hard to come by and expensive and lengthy to actually build it on your own in a green field. So that is just a launch. We launched it. We're just going to be announcing who the recipients are. And we'll have another round of that. Um, so we're happy about that one. The um, state small business credit initiative was an amazing outsized bunch of money that came into the state from the federal government. And the state of Vermont was able to get $52 million, which is, there's something called the small state minimum. That even, they do it on an allocation basis, if it's typically based on population. Well, we would be really in a bad way if they did it solely like that. But due to a small state minimum, which I believe Senator Leahy brought to us, we were able to get $52 million. To give you an example, Connecticut, which is like so much larger than we are, got $100 million. But they're not just twice as large as we are, right? So, we got $52 million. What did we do with it? We thought this was an opportunity to get funding for entrepreneurial businesses that can't get the money you know, on their own, a harder time raising the funds. So half of it went to uh, borrowing through VITA, and the other half went to um, equity fund managers, equity you know, venture capital fir firms, so that they could fund early stage uh, businesses so they could grow here in Vermont. 
If we don't have that capability here, they tend to go out to Boston or New York, and then the investors are wondering, why are you located in Vermont? Again, we're trying to alleviate the obstacles and the vulnerabilities that occur because of our location, because of our size, right? And so that was a tremendous opportunity. We have about nine years to spend down the funding. Um, Vermont has been pretty efficient. We uh, got all three tranches of the funding working, which is very, very good news. The DC is talking about reclaiming some of that money if you didn't pull down all the funds. So we're like, Phew. we were able to bring down as much as we were entitled to, so hopefully there won't be any clawback. I say hopefully, who knows what happens in DC. Um, yeah, and then community recovery and capital improvement also. What happened is during COVID, in, initially, we got hundreds of millions of dollars to give to businesses so they could stay afloat, right? Everybody was closed. And it was really a, almost a hopeless situation. So as soon as the federal government said they were going to, the first tranche was like $1.2 billion, I thought, all right, we have to get money for these businesses. Now, we may not be able to save every business, but we've got to give businesses at least a glimmer of hope that there's help for them to recover. That was good for the first tranche. When the second round of money came in, we thought, well, we don't want to just keep filling you know, working capital needs. We really want to plant seeds for the future. So capital investment came to mind so that this is an investment that will continue to pay dividends as years go on. And what do I mean by that? We want to fund expansions, any type of capital improvement that increases, let's say, the valuation of the building. So we were able to distribute 150 projects. We got 50 million in total to all sorts of businesses and nonprofits and housing development and childcare centers. Like it was a wide variety. Again, if you want to see the types, you could look on our site. We have them all listed. Um, yeah, because typically, I mean, just to give you a frame of reference, typically our agency and our department is so small that we get like $1.5 million for a workforce development program. And then during COVID, we got like $350 million. I mean, crazy town. It was just unbelievable the amount of scale change from one year to the next. But uh, we all kind of switched our gears just to focus on how do we get through this and then how do we recover and how could Vermont benefit from the federal largesse. The, uh, the training program that I was talking about is, um, it's basically, we go out to visit businesses and this training program is not a training program per se, it's a fund. So we help fund up to 50% of the cost of the training if the training is through a vendor or 50% of the on-the-job training, which most training in the, in the businesses we do call on, especially manufacturers, they do a lots of on-the-job training. They do cross skills and upskilling. And this is the type of thing that's music to our ears because it generally results in the employee earning more, more money. And that, that to us is the object of the game is creating opportunities, creating opportunities for people to earn a better living, opportunities for prosperity. And there's also the apprenticeship program, not done through our department, but through the Department of Labor. And that's encouraging getting early start. So businesses have been really, really tight with labor, unable to hire. So they've decided, OK, I'm going to grow our own. They'll start as early as high school or college and start training folks, get them in. And also, in some cases, they pay for college. So they'll do tuition reimbursement. Uh, it's a great program. Um, yeah, you might have heard about, I mean, a couple of years ago, there was money. We were giving money to people to move to Vermont. Very controversial program. We, um, originally, it was not the governor's idea. It was the legislature. And actually, it was uh, Congresswoman Becca Ballant. I think it came out of her committee. And uh, they gifted it to us. And we were like, what are we going to do with this? You know, because normally, our, our department works with businesses or municipalities. We don't work with individuals who just want to move to the state. But we're like, all right, well, let's give it a try. And we did it. And it, the publicity alone was immense. It was better than any, any advertising budget or any marketing dollars we could ever dream of. It just became so omnipresent. I think we had a billion impressions. We don't get a billion anything. And so um, about a couple of years it went through. We did first it was for remote worker 
if you work for a company outside the state. Second year, I think we added, it, you, if you're coming to the state to work for a Vermont employer, because we realized the Vermont employers really needed workers, we added it. And then we, I think we perfected it the final year, but then they didn't want to give any more money. They just said, look, there's a housing crisis. How could you pay money for people to come here if you don't have enough housing? So I don't know whether we're going to resurrect that, but we're clear in every town we go to, every town, every municipality, every business, they're talking about a lack of, not only a lack of employees, but a lack of applicants. You know, they used to put out a posting and get maybe 25 applicants, and now they're lucky they get three or four. So it, it is interesting, and some towns say they don't have enough volunteers for different you know, functions within the local government. So I'm thinking about it, we're not sure. <laughs> so. Yeah, so making Vermont more affordable, get back to the original premise, is really we need more people for more ac economic activity. We need more uh, workers, more jobs. And that does mean embracing business growth. You know, sometimes we like our small businesses, but once they grow, they're like, oh, they're too big. We like that. We want to encourage that. That's where human capital is developed. And um, more housing. That's, you know. The, employee, the employers that we're talking to that were able to hire somebody from away, some of the people have had to move back because they could not find suitable housing. So housing, housing, housing is like the number one priority. It'll be the priority at the legislature this year as well. Um, and I think that's it. I don't know if I've answered um, the question about how to make it affordable, but at least these are the pathways toward, toward that goal. And uh, I'd encourage, if you're interested in it, to please talk to your area legislators about it. Write to us with ideas. We're, we're happy to entertain them. Yeah. Yes. Yes, there's a group called UBM Innovations that we fund, uh, we fund partially. And uh, with those funds, we'll get either students or, um, in some cases, it's the professor, but uh, there's one such, I'm trying to think of, Verdi Technologies was a student out of UVM. And um, he got funding from UVM Innovations, and now he got a spot at um, Hula. He was able to start his business, and now I, I heard that he's looking for actually permanent space. So yes, we, we do do that. It's not. It's not an overwhelming volume, but we do do that. What we need to develop more, UVM uh, licenses lots of technology, great amount of research coming out of the institution. Um, not all of it ends up in a job creating entity here. Sometimes they license the technology and it goes out to Cambridge, Mass, as an example. So we wanna, we're getting closer and closer to UVM about how to develop that here. That, that is a, that's a goal. Oh wait, somebody has a question here. Who's speaking? There's somebody here. Ray, is it you? Uh, we need more housing. The big problem here is the construction costs. What can be done to lower construction costs? Maybe on tax? That side make that uh, favorable for construction. Yeah, no, I like I like what you're thinking. Um, we're talking about different ways we could do that. Like, it does get back to the population issue though, because some of the projects we were working with, when they put it out to bid, they got one response. So they're not every people were overwhelmed. There was because of all the money that came to the state, a lot of the construction companies were full up, you know, so they weren't always available, and that lack of availability and competition led to a higher price. Also, labor costs increased, right? So one thing we're thinking about is would, would a developer be encouraged if there were tax stabilization type incentives, right, to um, maybe limit it for a couple of years to see if that would bring it on? Um, but it, it does come down to we need more Players and we need more contractors. We need more um, housing contractors to 
to bring those prices down. It is it is a bit of a supply demand issue, and it does get tied back to to how to um, population. Thank you for being here. Your title is a bit of an anachronism. You're speaking about how more development could make it more affordable. I suggest up against it. Legislation is either unable, unwilling to do anything about it. And 52 percent of the state's budget goes to education, which contributes no income to the state except for those who benefit from the educational system. If you did all of these things and were successful, I'm not so sure it would make any difference. Yeah, I, it's a it's a huge issue. Um, yeah, I, I know that there's an education finance reform committee out there. I don't know what the outcome's going to be, but I think there's a recognition that we just can't keep spending the way that we've been spending. And the amount of school children has declined, so, it, and the ratings and the performance is not necessarily top notch. Yeah. Yeah. Less outcome. Yeah. No, it's a it's a problem. You know, we we get involved sometimes in discussions about um, talent pipeline development. You know, and and employers tell us that even some of the most recent grads can't do basic math. Um, and I don't know what to do about that. I don't know what to do about that. We we are this is what we're working with. Um, and I think some of it is. I mean, this is just my opinion, <laughs> whatever it's worth. I'm not an educator, but um, I think that we're very decentralized in the way that education it gets handed out. I mean, I heard one school district did away with the requirement for geometry. I was like, how could that be allowed? <laughs> you know, so there's so many jobs that depend on those types of basic skills. So we have a problem, and I don't have the answer right off, but what we've been doing probably isn't going to Probably not the answer, yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, my question is actually two questions, um, all related to housing and how possibly you might consider um, this option. To have housing, you obviously need land. And in order to build a house, you certainly need to have good infrastructure, meaning a road, in order to get from one place to the other. So my first question is, if a road were to be built, um, who would pay for that? I would imagine it would be the state that would pay for it to get it from to get a road from point A to point B. The second question um, I would have is that we all know that by combining an order for something like windows for housing, roofs and shingles and and bricks and mortar and so forth, combining it into a large purchase order, if the state could do something like that and then go ahead and allow builders and developers to purchase that from the state, most likely at a lower price with less, less fluctuation in the prices that are the current market value. It has been done in school systems by conglomerate collaborating together and purchasing desks and building supplies and so forth, um, and then going ahead and distributing it 40, 50, 100 square So that's where I'm getting the idea from. Could the state help at all with the stabilization of prices for our developers with a large purchase of basic supply? Right. Well, I wonder if we could do that even for the schools, because the schools have all these construction projects, and I'm not sure that those are all consolidated. In fact, they're probably not. It's all individual towns. So Vermont loves local control. I don't know how we do that. What, I mean, that seems like it makes perfect sense. You combine the orders, but we are so decentralized. The, um, 
the question about the roads, it really depends, right? There's some roads that are state roads, some roads are town roads, and some roads are private roads. And um, developers I've been talking to in a town in, in Chittenden County said that the town does not want to provide the infrastructure. They feel that we're making enough money on the housing, so they're going to have to foot the bill for the infrastructure. This is what we're up against. And some towns, it's not because they don't want to pay, it's that they don't feel that their town payers could afford another uh, bond. So it, it's, yeah, it, it, it depends. The 400 million that I'm talking to you about that the state spent, the state ended up sending that to Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. Um, and they are the ones who are divvying out the funding to all the different affordable housing developers. And whenever state money gets involved, there's usually affordability quotient, which means income restrictions. So it's not just any builder. It has to be those particular housing coalitions. I've not seen yet anything for a market rate type developer. Um, I say yet because who knows? We know that we need housing across the board. But I like your idea of a buying group, you know, that definitely makes sense. I just, I don't know how we do it with, we've got 251 towns and we've got how many school districts? 200 and, over 200. And they're all these separate governmental districts. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And I don't know if I'm on. Okay. And so the BOCES program in New York State, which is planted throughout New York State, they do educate students in grade 12. Also, purchasing um, agent as well as a supplier when schools need notebooks, papers, and pencils. We've got a big rural district here, obviously in Vermont, but, um, and you would know more about this itself, but the, the concept of consolidating and having this more stabilization of prices shared with various communities. So maybe it may be rural, but um, it is possible maybe their dorms could be built next to a BOCES for the trade school students in grades 11 and 12 because Vermont is desperate for students yes. to get into the trades. And the equipment at BOCES is often provided and donated by I agencies division. who wish to have the high schools train the students so that when they graduate from them, they have a ready-made job on modern equipment, not outdated equipment. So that kind of a thought process of how it is run in education is what makes me think of something like that yeah, to I think, help our builders. Yeah, I mean, I think you should run for office. <laughs> I'm not joking. I'm not joking. I mean, I think we need people with ideas on how to fix this because we can't, we're the administration, so like we just one piece of it and even Agency of Ed has limited, um, you know, purview. It's really, I don't know if you were here a couple years ago and they tried to do consolidation of schools. That was a tough go. We, we, consolidation is a good idea, but it's a dirty word in many, in many locations. So, but I, I think, yeah, your, your voice should be heard at your area legislators and education committee and, yeah. I think my comments is turned into a comment instead of a question uh, because she sort of asked it. Um, I'm um, a new Vermonter. I just moved here three and a half months ago from Mass. Massachusetts, Thank you. I'm a mass hole, please don't <laughs> shoot me. And I'm over 65 and I'm not feeling so welcome right now after <laughs> looking at your <laughs> slides, but I uh, worked in the fi fiber optics field in the uh, uh, store endoscopy, mm -hmm. made fiber optics scopes, and uh, they had a relationship with uh, Quinn Sigamon College uh, in Worcester nearby. Uh, also with Worcester Polytech Institute for higher level um, creativity mm -hmm. in, in regards to fiber optics. And so we did get students uh, through them. And I was wondering, do you seem to say, 
this is a great idea to do it. I'm just saying now that it does work. It does work in Massachusetts, at least in, in that case. Um, and I was wondering if there was going yeah, to be more I mean, of that. There are pockets. I mean, again, because we're so decentralized, you'll hear employers say, oh, yeah, we're working with this tech center in Essex or, or Burlington, wherever. So there are pockets where that is happening. It's just not systemic. That's where I think we, I would say, we, we fall down on that. It's very, very specific. A particular employer will, you know, send teachers to the tech center or, you know, send employees to the tech center. They get a program together. Next thing you know, the teacher left. Or, so it's not a systemic um, program. But, I mean, it's not all bad. I'm not saying that nothing exists. It exists. It's just it's not a statewide program. Each tech center is its own is a tech center for the individual district. Hi, Hi. thanks. Uh, I'd, I'd love to see those pie graphs compared to other states. So for example, the income cost, the comparing them. Yeah. Um, that's just another, for, for your next visit. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I do have a scenario I'd like to run by you. Sure. If someone owned a two-family home, and uh, they wanted to take it down. The zoning was okay. They wanted to take it down and put up an eight-family home where, so that they could create more affordable housing. Was there, is there a department they can come to? So Department of Housing and Community Development would be the place to start. So, um, you know, as long as it, you know, it's okay with zoning, what have you. They are encouraging density, and each town should be accommodative of that. I say should, because that piece of legislation passed, not this past session, but the session before. It hasn't been tried in court. Some municipalities are not playing. You know, they don't care about the density requirement of the state. So um, I think that's allowed, but I would start with DHCD, and Alex Farrell is the commissioner. And you could tell him I said to call him. <laughs> yeah, they, they get involved, but you know they're not going to be involved in a project by project, but basically the overarching policy. They could guide you on what. I mean, that's exactly what we're trying to provide is density, so there's more units that get produced. Um, not necessarily. Um, I, I, again, you know, I'm going a little bit out of realm. It depends on whether or not you're going to make any of the units affordable. So I would also check with uh, the Vermont Housing Finance Agency and also Vermont Housing Conservation Board. They're the ones who are going to either get funding and, yeah. I was, I'm concerned. I live near Spear Street, which is one of the most beautiful roads. And it's quickly being built up with housing. And I'm just wondering, if you are challenged by people that want to keep Vermont green. <laughs> of course, yeah. That is that is the, the argument, right? People are worried about it's going to become New Jersey, or there's all these worries. But we have such robust permitting. <laughs> we, you know, we've got local permitting. We've got regional permitting. We have state permitting. Like, it, it won't be New Jersey, but it may be not what a particular person would prefer, right? Um, I, I moved uh, recently to, well, a couple of years ago to Shelburne, and somebody was complaining about the houses that just got put up on Webster Avenue. And I was like, oh, I felt happy about that. At least there's housing there. It's, everyone has a different perspective. And yes, always there's going to be that push pull. It's not all building more. I mean, we, so just to give you an idea, if you have to go through, um, First, most towns have their own zoning districts, so you can't just build anywhere, A. And then um, Act 250, Act 250 has like nine or 10 different criteria. Some of it has to do with ag soils. Some of it has to do with um, the view. You know, it takes into consideration all of these aspects. So I, I don't see it becoming so dense that it, all of a sudden we're like a little city. but. Um, we can't keep doing what we've been doing, which is we're more heavily worried about the pre preserving than the actual growth, right? Because I think the last time Vermont really grew was in the 70s, right? <laughs> and so that regulation came into place, and it did exactly what it should. It slowed it down. Okay. Now, are we good with that? Is that good? 
you know, we're going to be able to survive with the current state or not. If you look around the state, we did this a couple years ago, we looked at the grand list growth, and it was mainly stagnant or declining. So it's not a good picture, because when you have stagnant or declining grand list, it just means that you're just going to be paying more and more each year, because you have to make up for that decline in value. We have a real problem now with all the flood impacted towns that we're going to lose housing units, they're going to lose grand list value, so we have to plan uh, large scale where are we going to build the units. Where does it make sense? It doesn't make sense to build it by the river. You know, so they, it, we've got a, a lot of pain going on in the next, you know, I'd say three to five years at least. This is our last question. Um, and it's just a, you said you welcomed ideas on this nice idea back here about combining costs. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, the Vermont Council on Rural Development has visioning programs and yes. they've covered tons and tons of communities all the way from Essex County like Island Pond yes. all the way down to um, southern Vermont. Um, and to every session, they bring legislators, they bring people who know about grants. So it seems to me if grants were made, it were, the opportunity for grants was created to consolidate costs on different purchases, the, v the, the VCRD visioning processes would be a perfect vehicle to convey that information to communities when they come up with their vision and, okay, here we want to do something with our schools, we want a community center, we want whatever there is in their vision, then the people who are tell there telling them about the grants that exist, if there were an opportunity, they could steer them toward, okay, to make this, this part of your vision more affordable, you could collaborate with these other communities to do the same thing. And that way the, in, this, the, comment, the, the opportunity would be introduced, but it would still be locally driven. Right. No, it's great. I, you know, we're talking about this now in terms of rivers management because with flooding, it isn't really just up to one town. It has to be a, a watershed type thing. And those are not simple conversations at all. You would think everyone would just pitch in do what's right for the, the group, but it's not, yeah, I'm going to say it's not easy. This but, has been yeah. terrific. Joan, thank you yeah, so thanks. much. Yeah, thanks. You're great. Wow.